All right, everybody. Whew, I finally got here. We're ready to start. Corner hey, to everybody. corner. I'm Tom Vassell. Hi, I'm Rado, Richard Hamm. This is all my fault. Sorry for the delay, everybody. Note to self, do not reboot Xfinity Router 15 minutes before showtime. 15 minutes is not enough, as it happens. Yeah. I try not to reboot anything ever, unless you're forced to. <laughs> yeah, for that, for that very purpose. Yeah. Alrighty. Well, lots of things going on. We are now in the final month of the year. Um... And Rado has got a song stuck in my head since he posted on BGG. It's the end of the year as we know it, and now it's stuck <laughs> in my head. Yeah. All right. So How what? What game is in front of you? This. Oh, never mind. Is, I know what that is. Yeah, this is the ISS Vanguard. This is insane. This is such a huge game. The latest thing from Awakened Realms. I think it's going to be going live uh, next week, not on Kickstarter, but on their own game found. Uh, alternative to Kickstarter, and I know a lot of people, because of the kind of the art and the look of the game, are going to call this Mass Effect the board game, you know, from the creators of uh, Tainted Grail and, um, you know, this War of Mine, but to me, everything I've seen so far, this really encapsulates the spirit and soul of Star Trek, because this is a game all about exploration. This book is the ISS Vanguard. It's multiple pages. These different pages represent different sectors of the ship that you can upgrade with different cards and whatnot over the course of the game. There is a crew of hundreds of people on this ship. We are just, you know, um, officers with really awesome miniatures. And when we go on away missions, we have to build our crew. This book actually keeps track of the status of the of the ship, the Vanguard, and um, we are going and exploring through all kinds of different planets represented by this big book. We have different landing craft that can get outfitted in different ways. It comes with a storybook, or you can use the app to get professional voice acted story stuff. It's this is I think going to be their biggest production yet. These dice, I don't know what they're made of. They feel like stone. They are very heavy. Um, and it's, I, I just, I just got it out yesterday and started trying to read the tutorial and I barely scratched the surface and it's, it's a lot. Well, anyhow, folks, tune in next week. We'll be playing it live on the channel. Oh, will you? <laughs> yeah. How that's... far have you gotten? Oh, I opened the box. <laughs> and that is a big step in and of itself. Yeah. I said to, I said to Marson from Awaken Realms, I said, can't you guys ever do like a simple game? It make everyone's <laughs> lives a lot easier. Yeah. He's like, I wish. <laughs> so. <laughs> All righty. Well, um, trying to think of what else. It's December, the end of the year. Top ten games at the end of the year are coming. So. Yep. 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 I think the game will be easier, hopefully, than, than Rado just made the game sound. There's a lot going oh, on, yeah, but yeah. I, I think it's thematic, and it should work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, it also comes with a very uh, detailed and elaborate tutorial to walk you through the first few steps. I'm about halfway through that tutorial right now. So far, it's been pretty smooth sailing, um, and it's just the, the, the sheer volume of stuff is off the hook. Alrighty, folks, well, we're going to get jumping into things. We're going to start, as always, by taking a look at a mechanism, supposedly, yes. on Board Game Geek. <laughs> I say this because as we go here to Board Game Geek and I go through the mechanism list, today we get to something called Cooperative Game. Yes. Players Would you consider that a mechanism, Tom? I do not. Would you consider that a category of I, game? I would. <laughs> there we go. All right. I mean, uh, I'm glad we're in agreement on this. Saying cooperative is a mechanism is the same as saying war game is a mechanism. Yeah. As yeah. or party game or what have. You. Technically, it's true. Is it? I, I understand. I mean, that you know, this has actually been on the site for a long time. Uh, cooperative game as a mechanism predates Jeff Engelstein's kind of revamp of all the classifications of things. And I can imagine, I can imagine 10 years ago, when before Pandemic even came out, or no, it came out about 10, it came out over 10 years ago now, oh my gosh! But um, I can imagine 20 years ago, 
when all they've got is Arkham Horror and the Lord of the Rings game. And it's like, well, yeah, there's a, there's this co-op thing. Mostly it's in kids' games. Does anybody really care? Oh, fine, let's put a mechanism in. And cut to today, where what? Probably one out of every five games that comes out is a co-op game. It is the single biggest, most explosive uh, form of growth in the industry. And so calling it a mechanism is definitely legacy. But I'm happy to talk about it as a mechanism. Well, I suppose. now I'm, you have me intrigued here. I sorted these by date. Oh, interesting. Uh, of course, a whole bunch of them have no dates. So and now I got to jump around so I find the ones with dates. Why would these games have no date on them? No one uh, knows. Because when... they haven't come out yet. Because they've been announced or, you know, the publisher. No, well, that's not the case. I'll tell you what, if I may make a small complaint here, first world complaint, I'm getting tired of companies picking the date of their game before they publish the game on Board Game <laughs> Geek. And it matters a lot because when we go to do the best games of the year, there are so many games that are incorrectly listed as 2019. And at this point in time, we can clearly see some games that are not going to be 2020, but they're still listed as 2020 in the database. Yes, definitely. Although, like you said, I mean, these are relatively small problems. Just, uh, But it is kind of a pain. All right, so here's games that are listed as cooperative. Old yeah, Husband you... at Large, 1962. It's on page 308 if you sort them by date. Okay. Farmer Nadell, Boob Tube. I haven't heard anyone call it the Boob Tube in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Crazy clock game. I'm looking for like a game that we might know. Yeah, a, a, a definitive early something that predates Arkham Horror in the '80s, or uh, yeah, I mean because Arkham Horror is the earliest example I can think of. Hmm. There's a lot of games here that are listed that are old, but none of these really have a lot of ratings. So I'm still in the 70s. Here's one called Death Maze. This one has 243 ratings. Came out in 1979. Okay, so and from the title, I'm assuming it's a, uh, a Dungeon & Dragons inspired tabletop game. Yeah, and I'm still not even sure it's cooperative other than that players are all going through the same dungeon. Yeah. All right, let's keep looking here. This is more interesting than talking about cooperative games. Well, yeah, I mean, br broadly speaking, uh, yes, players work together towards a common goal. Um, and there are several different mechanisms under which that is... And there's yeah, I'm more Citadel of Blood, which is based Jeez. on that game I just talked about. Okay. So, again, b uh, board games taking inspiration from Dungeons & Dragons, which, I mean, is obviously... A cooperative game as well and kind of hugely important in the overall evolution i right, hear some more the, uh, art form yeah citadel blood just kind of reprinted the other one intruder nope that's a one verse many game so that doesn't count okay spiel dexterity game i don't know how this is considered cooperative at all <laughs> time tripper this is basically a solitaire war game that could be cooperative. Mm -hmm. The Wreck of the BSM Pandora, another solitaire slash war game. Huh. I'm really curious which one of these is going to be like what we would consider the first true. Oh, there we go. Sherlock oh, okay. Holmes, Consulting Detective. Sure. Although, I don't know. I think you can argue that Sherlock Holmes, Consulting Detective is more of an experience. Than a game, it is a storytelling exercise. But yeah, you do get a score, and so because there is a score, there is, in fact, a game. Um, I don't know though. I think I think you're going to have that mid '80s Arkham Horror. You know, the first edition is the earliest I could think of. Uh, unless you want to give it to Sherlock Holmes, but I, I don't. I, I, that, that well, I get Sherlock Holmes. That's more of a. So this is actually a fairly new in in the life of board games. I mean, yes. Here's a game called Shadows in the Forest. Actually, this is a game that recently was reprinted by Think Fun. Oh, it's a kids game. No, but that's still one verse many. That's not cooperative. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a good thing that Board Game Geek actually created a 
uh, classification since it seems the developers themselves don't know what their games are. Here's one called Max that came out. And here's Orc. Okay, so there are kids' games. That's for hey, sure. This is what I was saying. Kids' games have had cooperation woven in for decades. Uh, it's, but, you know, uh, 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 cooperation isn't for adults, not for serious gamers. If you, I mean, because serious games always uh, start with chess and go. And if you're not do or, or war games, and if you're not fighting somebody, you're not trying to destroy them, you're not really playing a game. Just why to this day there are still people out there that insist multiplayer solitaire Euro style goods conversion games aren't really games if you're not actually trying to destroy somebody. It's just kind of woven into the DNA of what makes a game based on really most of human society and evolution. But, I mean, have you found anything big prior to, I went and looked it up, 1987 Arkham Horror? I haven't. I just pulled it up. Arkham Horror. Um, by the way, real quick, shout out to Coralou who mentioned that they should have a pending flag and board game geek until the game's actually released. That's that would be awesome. Idea. I concur. Yep, Arkham Horror. This I've never actually played this version of the game. Oh really? I have. It looks <laughs> terrible, frankly. It kind of is. It's uh when I first got into the hobby after discovering pandemic, and everybody say, Oh, you gotta try Arkham Horror, it's the most amazing thing. And I was looking online to buy it used and all it was very expensive. And I thought, oh, look, here's somebody selling for like 15 bucks. And I got it in the mail, and it was the 1987 version. I'm like, really? This is what everybody's so excited about? It was, the, the basics are there. The, you know, the DNA of what we know of as Arkham Horror. But yeah, that second edition is pretty much an entirely new game. It wasn't until 2005, though, that that second edition came out. Yeah, yeah. So that was a good chunk of time. I had heard about it in the background but I never really knew much about it until then. So I'm I mean, going to really? guess. I mean, I, I, I heard about it, but I never played it. I just knew yeah. it was in existence. That's it. The first thing that really puts co-op on the map, though, has to be Reiner Knizia's Lord of the Rings, right? I agree. Well, I think it put co-op in the map in a different way. That put yeah. it in a, there for, um, well, here's Star Wars Escape from the Death Star. That was, that one's legit. And Hero Quest, oh, that's one versus many. Exactly. Um, yeah, so I'll just say Lord of the Rings. I'm going to change this now to number of ratings so we don't get... Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I would argue that Lord of the Rings made people aware it existed, mm -hmm. but it was Pandemic that put it on the map map. Yes, exactly. Um, you had Lord of the Rings, and then a, a couple of games like Forbidden Planet uh, over the ensuing years, Ghost Stories, but it was pandemic that made the entire industry say oh yeah this is what we call an untapped market um and now today pandemic defines if there was a cooperative mechanism you might as well call it pandemic the idea that you have a map of a of a place and you have characters running around fighting fires which is one of the core mechanism or, or constructs for cooperative today oh we have a thing we have to do but there's constantly stuff popping up that we have to deal with that gets in the way of us doing what we need to do and um and that and you know and, and uh, you know pandemic is so influential so many cooperative games are well you have four action points here's a list of all the things you can do with those action points here's the thing that happens every round to mess up your plans and everybody has a special power I mean, Matt Leacock himself has gone back to that well several times with his Forbidden series. Well, I mean, if you look here, it's interesting. So the top three, well, most played co-op games are Pandemic, Forbidden Island, okay. and Pandemic Legacy Season 1, all Matt Leacock. There you go. Yes. Now. So he is co-op personified, which has got to be kind of a bummer for him. You know he wants to break out. And he has tried other stuff. But people keep wanting that co-op because people love cooperating. It's woven into our DNA, and it's just something that, uh, for some people, is it's kind of a, a an, an odd transition to make. That gaming could mean we, we I, I work with you, I don't destroy you. Is this still a game? You know, kind of a thing. It's a big enough thing now where I just I've been putting together my end of the year lists and yeah, cooperative. I'm doing a top ten co-op games of the year. And I had plenty of choices. I wasn't mm -hmm. squishing to make 10. Uh, so that's a big deal. Someone here mentioned in the comments, they said, if we look at a, a guy named Odd Audio, he said, if we look at cooperative as a mechanism, then a yes. one verse all game has it as a mechanism. 
okay, if the mechanism is simply the fact that they're, yeah, okay, fine, all right. Because you're right, one versus all does feel like a mechanism to me. <laughs> and it's, it's no more or less than cooperation. All right. Well, <laughs> oh! I'm not saying this. I'm not arguing. I, I, I agree with you, actually. All right. The next, the number four game here is Gloomhaven. Now, this is one I want to talk about interesting because Gloomhaven was not the first dungeon crawl to do this. Uh, the D&D ones did it before and probably some other ones. But dungeon crawls traditionally were one person versus many. Well, Gloomhaven changed that, and, well, it's the biggest one that changed it, but many other games, to the point where there's almost no dungeon crawl that exists right now, uh, any of the new ones, and there's a new one that comes out every week. Yes. Um, almost none of them are one versus all. They're almost all cooperative against the game. Right, and that used to be the norm, you know, because everybody took their, um, their uh, fo everybody followed on the Descent format where there was the equivalent of a malevolent dungeon master trying to kill everybody, running the game, but the majority of everybody's focus was working together to beat that that dungeon master or game master, whatever the game would call it. And you're right. I mean, you don't see that now, do you? Uh, that's really fallen out of favor. What was the last one? Was it I, Nemesis? I don't know. Even Descent, which was a big one. In Descent... No, Nemesis, you're... Semi co oping. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, okay. In, in Nemesis, you're all trying to get off the ship and you may be bad or good or whatever. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Hitting traitor stuff. Right, right, right. But Descent, even the new Descent, which was just announced, is going to be cooperative. What? Oh, wow. Because, of course, they, they're drilling down on the. Look, you don't have to have a human player playing the. The bad guy, the app will do it for you. I will say this. As much as I like, I don't mind the fact that there's dungeon crawls that are cooperative. You know, it is what it is. I just, yeah. I, I don't know that we need to throw them all out. I do like the one versus many. It is fun to play against a human rather than a computer. In fact, I was talking today. One of the reasons I think Gloomhaven's successful is because when you go up against the monsters, it's not necessarily set what they'll do. Yes, they have a deck. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't know which card's going to come out in that deck, as opposed to most of these games. This monster always moves five spaces towards the nearest hero and swings at him. That's just yeah. how they work. Mm -hmm. um, and a human being might say, I'm going to go beat up on the wizard because that wizard's killing me. While a computer will go, I will go towards the weakest person. Or better, a human being will start moving all of the monsters out of the room. And next, well, what's happening? What do we follow? Is it a trap? Right. And, yeah. So, I mean, I get the reason. I know that cooperative games are more appealing because the a game with a dungeon master puts a lot of onus on that person. They usually need to know the rules better than everybody else. There's yeah. more upkeep for that person to do. Sometimes they have to play substandard because they're there to facilitate a good time, not to crush the opponent. Yeah, that is a problem with some of those games where it's far too balanced that oh, if you play correctly where you are just supposed to create a problem for the players the players will lose and have a miserable time and that's a tough balancing act to get right i'm curious so mansions of madness uh i think is really at the forefront of you know the the was the second edition of look replace the human control of the world with an app how did you feel because i know you've played both uh, making that switch over and losing the human behind all the monsters moving and making decisions with an app doing it. In that particular game, I thought it was amazing because the human was essentially an app. They weren't making conscious choices and there was so much room for error. In Mansion of Madness, the first edition, if I messed up on setup at all, I could ruin the game. Exactly. Uh, uh, three hours later, you find out, oh, the game is unfinishable because I forgot that in the second room, this thing was supposed to be there. Yeah. And so I didn't I didn't care about that. I'm more unhappy with the, the move by Descent, which is essentially becoming a, a Manchester Madness game. Yes. I, I'm OK if they had just made a new game in the, that universe with that. But Descent was fun for me to be the dungeon master, to pick the bad guys that would yeah. come in the room. And I feel like that's missing a bit. And I also felt like we don't need... We have Gloomhaven. We have... Again, there's so many of these dungeon crawlers out there. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I can understand Fantasy Flight. Look, we're bringing out a new descent. We know it will do better as a pure co-op. Because I do think, for the most part, the audience has spoken. People want to play together. Um, you know, they, they want to work towards a common goal. They don't want to be have all their thought bent on, right, how do we defeat you and prevent your plans from coming to fruition? Because... Well, for some of us, that's just not fun. Um, it is kind of a bummer, though, that they didn't, you know, kind of uh, have their cake and eat it, too, where there is still a mode where, look, yeah, you can have the app, or here's the, all the cards and resources I would need as a human to make the decisions that the app would make. Because I'll be honest, I have played both Mashins of Madnesses, and I preferred the original. And generally, I was the mansion runner. Uh, having him, you know, keep track of everything, and I really enjoyed it. It's the closest I've ever been to a dungeon master in a traditional pen and paper, and it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, trying to ensure, yeah, look, I'm trying to play and make smart moves, but more than anything else, I'm just trying to make sure everybody else around the table is having a good time, and I really, really loved that. And uh, it's something that I think is going out of style as apps. Uh, dungeon masters are being replaced by apps. They're taking <laughs> our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> technology all right um so there's two things here about i love co-op i know you do too we like yes. cooperative games um but there are some versions of co-op that there's two main subsets of co-op there okay. is the co-op with a hidden trader started from shadows over camelot yeah. made popular by Battlestar galactica dead of winter etc and then there is the elusive, and in my opinion, pretty much impossible to implement properly, semi-co-op. <laughs> um, yeah. To the point where I just had someone email me and they said, I have a new semi-co-op game. And I said, you can send it. But be warned, I tend to already dislike it based on that fact. Because I found that in a semi-co-op game where some people, where you all win together, but one person is the real winner or what have you, they always yeah. devolve into one person realizing that they can't win by themselves, so they'll sabotage it for everybody else. God, I cannot imagine sitting down to a table and playing with a player whose mindset is that. The, you know, I, I, well, if I can't win, I'll have the whole world burn. Well, well sure, no, no. To do the best I, I, I know that you say that, but I think that more people are that way than you think. Not necessarily are in a... you? Well, well, not in a nefarious way. Not in a way, well, if I can't win, nobody will win. But there is a sense of, if I can't win, why am I trying to help you? Why would I give up my resources to help you? I don't because want you to win still either. for second place or third place. No, but there is no second or third place in a lot of these semi-co-op games. It's well, no, one person wins. I would argue that that is a mistake on the publisher's part to not clearly define that, just like in real life, the Olympics... People care if they win the silver or the bronze. Yeah, but that's it's not like. But that's not a. I, I, that's I not mean, semi co op really though. Put that forward. That's not semi co op. That's just straight competition. I don't mind if I come in second or third in a competitive game, but I do mind if we're all working together, but only one of us can win. Well, okay, I see what you're saying. Actually, strictly speaking, there are two branches of semi cooperative. There are two approaches to it. The one I think works better is CO two. This is a competitive game. We are all seeing who will win, who will come in first, who will come in second. But every once in a while, the game pushes back. And if we do not put aside our enmity and work together towards a common goal, everybody dies. I have I much less of a problem with that. Format that can work. I, I think it's more of a problem. Um, what's it? Castle Panic or Legendary. The idea that, oh, look, we're really playing a cooperative game, but somebody gets points at the end of the game. That's meaningless. There is just no reason to do that at all. Which is why most people play Castle Panic or Marvel Legendary and completely ignore the fact that I, there is a win. I which agree. makes Black Widow completely pointless. Her special power of getting extra points. And it's like, I, I don't see... I, I see very little value in pursuing that. That Look, we're all trying to work together, but I'm still sometimes holding a little bit back so that I can have five more points new at the end of the game. I think that is a recipe for failure. The problem the with that is... is I think can work. Sam and uh, I forget. Sam and somebody else were in a. One of my friends were in a tournament one time for Legendary Marvel Legendary. Oh yeah. And because oh, okay. only one person would advance from the table, right? People were playing substandardly, not helping each other because they wanted to have the most points, and then that just ruins the whole game. 
Well, so that's the thing. I, I wonder, is that the original designer's intent? Uh, Castle Panic is a lovely family gateway game, but it's so easy. It's if everybody, pl if if nobody holds cards back so that they can get the really big kills to get the big points. And I've always felt that no, their intent is that you know little Billy at the table decides not to help because he wants to win the game, even though we all have to work together. But j nobody does that except apparently in this one um, tournament that probably nobody walked out of very satisfied. It sounds like. I guess. I Again, I just feel whenever someone says that that's the case, I'm like, meh. You know, and even worse are the games where they'll say there's, these are usually one versus all, but there's like an alien and like the thing. And yeah. if he oh, takes yeah. you over, you're on his team now. And after a while, I'm like, oh, well, I might as well just let myself be taken over because then I'm on the winning team. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Some of these games, they're cooler in real life than they are as an actual game. Yeah, along those lines, there was a neat game from Bernd Eisenstein, the guy who did Polyphonies, called Pax, which is about the uh, slave uprising in ancient Rome, and players are you know tr trying to lead the rebellion, uh, and we, but we're still competing to be the the leader of of you know our, our post rebellion society, but players can, if they choose to, halfway through the game, throw their lot in with the Romans and say, yeah, I don't think we're going to win. I think the Romans will win and I'll be the first to betray everybody else. Uh, and then it suddenly becomes, it was effectively a semi-co-op game and then it becomes a fully competitive game halfway through. And that was actually really interesting, especially because my wife, without fail, every time we played, would always betray the rebellion and, um, and then make me work really hard to try to save things. Because... Getting back to cooperative, one thing I have found, I love cooperative games. My wife likes them, but often they don't work for her because she is very quick to tune out if she feels like the game is unwinnable, if it feels like there's too much stuff being thrown at you, you know, the ghost stories approach to design. And I keep saying, honey, you know, this is designed to be this way uh, because, you know, it, it's unsurmountable odds, but slowly but surely we will scrape ahead. And she just has no patience for that. And it always kind of surprises me. Um, and it's kind of a bummer, because that's why a lot of them don't work. I assume you don't have that problem. I know you love ghost stories. I'm getting, actually, no. Really? I've, I've really, if people watching the Dice Tower know that over the last year, I've been griping about this more and more and more. Because... You know, yes, I remember you talking about this on Album a few weeks ago. I'm just sick of cooperative games being super hard out the gate. Even in like Mission 1, and the problem I have with these games being super hard is sometimes it's you must do this, 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 and this to beat it. Yeah. And it's no longer, or sometimes you need to rely on luck to beat them. Mm -hmm. I love, I still don't understand the most successful cooperative game in the world right now is Pandemic. Pandemic is not that hard on the basic level. Yeah. But you can easily ramp up the hardness of it. You're like, oh, this is too easy. Not a problem. Put in all the epidemics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be pretty hard. And every once in a while, this is actually one of those ways that we know. Um, we know that uh, someone's lying about Pandemic. Because every once in a while on a thread on Reddit or Board Game Geek somewhere, someone will show up and go, I'm playing Pandemic on the hardest level. And we beat it every single time. You know, <laughs> why is this game so easy? And then <laughs> I'm always like, you're playing it wrong. Yeah, because you've met you've messed up a rule. <laughs> because you're not fail. beating it on the hard level every single time. Yep. You know, um, yeah. it's sometimes in pandemic, you literally can't win on the hard yeah, level. It's mathematically impossible based on the the composition of the deck. Although that's really more of a high difficulty level thing. Yeah, it's definitely true. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And certainly, the biggest mistake anybody trying to make a cooperative game can do in development is not include variable difficulty levels. I, I've always just flabbergasted when I see that they haven't done that. Uh, because, uh, you know, there's such a wide range of experiences players want. Uh, you, know, you know, just, I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily want to feel, a lot of players, beaten down by a deck of randomly drawn cards. And it's just no fun for them. They just want a problem that they can overcome and feel good about themselves. Whereas other players do say, look, if the game doesn't beat me the first three times I play, there's something wrong. So it's, it's crucial thinking about it now, ISS Vanguard is a cooperative game, and I haven't gotten very far in the rules. I don't think I've seen anything about difficulty levels. Hmm. Well, we'll just wait and see. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
it might be at the end of the rules too. Sometimes that that's where the that's where the stuff is. That is almost always the case. Yes. But I think a lot of this has to do with video games. So, for example, there's video games that like Dark Souls, and other video games which yeah, are yeah. incredibly difficult. But I get that, and I know there's people who enjoy that. But there's also a lot of video games out there that you can just kind of swing through them and have a good time. <laughs> You know, and, and they'll even say that. Like, I just started playing a game, and basically they gave you difficulty level. One of them was story mode. And they're like, you're going to beat the monsters, probably. Yeah. You're just you going through no this to see what here. happens. You, you cannot die. Sure. Well, I mean, you can die, but you're kind of an idiot. <laughs> I was actually... So I'm playing the new Spider-Man game that just came okay. out. The PlayStation Spider-Man game. And me and my daughter are playing the same game. She's playing on hard level. I'm playing on story mode. And when you watch the games, you would think we're playing on the same level. Because uh, I'm like, oh, man, I almost died there. And she's like, me too. I'm like, oh, good. We're the same level. Oh, no, wait, we're not. <laughs> but I don't care because that's the way I want to play it. I just wish more board games were like uh, it's, that. It's, it's always surprising to me when they don't recognize that. And, um, yeah, I mean, but as we just discussed, Cooperative games are still a relatively new thing in human history. As I mean, it's just so weird to think. You know, we've been around for tens, hundreds of thousands of years, and we're only just now starting to come up, hey, maybe we can have fun working together instead of trying to crush each other. Maybe that's a new thing for us. So no surprise that uh, there's still some baby steps being made. All right, here we go. Top five time. All right, so I have a proposal to make. Oh, go, sir. I would like to change this to okay. the top six list. Whoa. And I would like to make a new rule that we just both pick three and mash okay. them together. That way we're not vetoing the other person's dire love. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of loved it. I kinda... <laughs> yes. I kind of liked calling you out as a monster for vetoing some of the greatest games of all time. Folks, give us your topics. What do you want us to pick? <laughs> I think I veto your anti-veto stance. Yeah, this is my only yeah. chance not to be a Care Bear. Oh, wow. People were ready this time. <laughs> well, we, we were five minutes late to the show, so what else did they have to talk about other than what top five should it be? Or top six. Hmm. Six just doesn't work for me. Sorry. It's just weird. Top five, top ten. That's the way it's got to be. Well, if you're tied to numerical systems, that's fine. I kind of am. <sighs> Weren't you a math teacher? I would think you were as well. Eh, I got over it. <laughs> yeah. You got burned out. Uh, Man, I'm like skipping most of these because they're either... Meh, or they're too big, or I'm about to do them. Folks, don't ask us to do any top five of the year stuff. We're going to do that stuff. <laughs> yeah, we're both covering that this month. We might even do an additional five after that top five. I think Rada will do that one, but I'll put it on here anyway. Well, now I'm going to seek it out and do it. Well, no, I wrote it on the list here. I'm just saying. All right. I like how about half the people are actually already adopting your top six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So apparently you have been... Uh... <gasps> My first veto is to veto top six. That's fine. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Let's do it. I wrote down six things here, so you can pick one of these. Okay, there's our six. Two are, yeah, I know. Ha! Um, two of these are with the season. So top five Christmas songs, top five Christmas movies, okay. top five alternate win conditions in games. That's come up before, if I recall. Probably. Top five werewolf roles, mm -hmm. top five flags. I just thought that was funny. And the top five things you would change about BGG. Uh, 
Oh, man. Okay. You know what? Whoever is after those alternate wind conditions, they have been on that for months, it feels like. Am I wrong? I, I don't like know. I, 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 next, we're going to be back in two weeks, folks. We'll do a Christmassy holiday one then. I, I think uh, we, we've gone for quite a while without game stuff. And so this is ostensibly a game related show. So, yeah, alternate win conditions. Ooh. Which means we have to define what is the base win condition then, so we can say what alternates are. All right, folks. Well, this is a good chance for you to list them in the comments. Yeah, and definitely. Yeah, help us out here. Here's a couple off the top of my head Shooting the Moon and Hearts. Right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I don't know what that means. Oh, well, then you're not going to pick it. <laughs> Uh, well, it's Picatus. Shooting the moon in hearts. When when you play hearts, every time you take a heart in a trick, you get a point. Points are bad. But okay. if you take all the hearts, then everyone else gets 20 points and not you. Oh, I see. Okay, turning a, yeah, uh, turning a bad thing into a good thing. I've certainly seen that in other games. And that is actually very cool. The, oh my gosh, I'm so desperate to avoid that. Oh my God, I'm in so deep. All right, I'm going to do nothing but that now. Because if you can cross the threshold, you can turn it into a win, right? That's basically it. Yeah. I do like and quite frankly, having said that, why isn't that more common? That's just really cool. It's it's fun. It has to be something I think that's incredibly difficult, or else someone will just immediately start it. Um, mm-hmm. Also, nobody if you ever, starts out trying to shoot the uh, moon and hearts. Well, no sure, but it's really well. You can, but I mean, you have to have the perfect hand for it. Okay. Um, there's also in Liberté. Liberté from Martin Wallace is a game about scoring points, but you can also win by revolution or counter-revolution over the course of the game. Okay. Um, Space Base has the you win card in it. <laughs> yeah. That is fun. Have uh, you ever done it, Tom? And huh? have, you ever, have you ever not tried to do it when it's available to you? I have always tried to do it. One time... I was on the way to doing it and at a convention and I had to go do something. So I had someone take over for me and they didn't do it. And I feel like if I had stayed there, it would have happened. It would have happened. It would have happened. That was your moment. Innovation uh, from Asmati Games has multiple alternate win conditions in it. Yeah. As does uh, Glory to Rome as well. That's correct. Yeah. Glory to Rome, I think, or Innovation from the same Carl Chuddock. I think those are both good poster child for... Yeah, this doesn't have to be about points. Root has dominance cards in it. Okay. Um, Magic the Gathering has a few alternate ways to win. Uh, In Seven Wonders, Duel, you can win through military or science. Yeah, yeah. Um... Let's see. Are folks not coming up with stuff? In Arkham Horror, second edition, you could fight monsters instead of closing or sealing the gates. Um, trying to think yeah, of that. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's kind of the shooting the moon. That is, look, we're here trying to shut these gates. Oh, dear, this is not going to work. We're out of time. All right, let's just fight the big bad itself. And we're probably going to lose, but let's give it a go. That's true. And on yeah. that matter, if you play with the expansion to Lord of the Rings, Friends and Foes, there was an alternate victory condition where you could um, kill every monster and win. Mm-hmm. Also, in War of the Ring, you can win by the light side can defeat the dark side. Very difficult to do. Um, you're supposed to throw the ring in the... Oh, that's the big dudes on a map super, yeah, war game. Mm-hmm. Uh, a point value win, as in coffee roaster? Uh, well, that's still points, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure that matters. Yeah. Oh, forcing your opponents to go to DEFCON 1 and Twilight Struggle. That's really hard to pull off, but it is possible. Okay. I'm just looking through my favorite games, and every one of them is about points. <laughs> I'm looking for alternates. I think I've made a terrible mistake, Tom. You picked it. I know! It's because it's come up like 10 times over the last six months. You keep throwing it in the list. You're partially responsible. Well, I like to point out that I could do a top five. Just saying. <laughs> you guess. As a Euro gamer, I could come up with lots of variations in the form of victory points. Thresholds, uh, you know, countdowns. But it's all still about points, baby. 
And I, I don't know that that's a... <laughs> Dune has an alternate victory condition where the Ben Je- Benny Jesuit can predict who will win. Oh, and if oh, that person cool. wins on that round, they win instead. Cosmic Encounter has alternate victory conditions. Sure. Um, would you like to retract and pick one of the other topics? We've discussed this one. <laughs> Do you think we have a solid five? Yeah, but it wouldn't be you wouldn't be part of it, so you you probably have to. I can appreciate them intellectually. <laughs> And I have played Arkham Horror all the way through a couple of times. The original and the second edition. Arkham Horror, the second edition, in one of the expansions, they added a small mini thing where you could make a deal with Cthulhu, go bad, win by yourself against everybody else. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it was like really hard to pull off. Though. You had to get uh-huh. the right cards. Um, yeah. I, I, I was thinking about it now. I got nothing. But I'm happy with, the, with those five. For, right, you know, well, I've, I've heard several good things that I know are I'll good. I'll put Space Base on the action. list. Space Base, uh, that you win card, is just so much fun. It's Yeah, it is just. Uh, and, 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 and what's it? Um, Glory to Rome has kind of the same idea. I'll There's put Glory to Rome card. on the list. No one should complain about that. Yeah. And we'll put Root on the list, since everyone has been saying that in the comments. Okay. Here, folks, I can't put King of Tokyo, and here's why. Because King of Tokyo doesn't really have an alternate win condition. It has two equally viable win conditions. They both can be done. So Yeah. yeah, yeah this is all about just weird little offshoot things. And even Seven Wonders Duel, I'm hesitant to put on the list. Because even though points is probably the way the game will end... The other two victory conditions by science or for military mm-hmm. are so strong and so viable that you are thinking about them the whole game. Yeah. All right, we'll take it off then. Well, I didn't put it on yet. We're I have three. About these weird little oddballs. Um, I mean, the, the, the hearts thing, I, I, that sounds awesome. Let's put on Arkham Heart just because we were talking about it today. Yeah, yeah. I can't put on hearts, and I'll tell you why. Why is that? I thought about that, but shooting the moon only wins you the hand. Oh. It doesn't win you the game. You're saying you wouldn't go for multiple shots at the moon? Over it's the not of- very possible. <laughs> now, if you play the new um, Indulgence game from uh, Restoration Games, where shooting the moon is possible every turn, you can shoot the moon, shoot the moon. It's like a, <laughs> basically each turn someone has a condition. Like take blue cards is bad, but if you take all the blue cards, you shot the moon, right? Yeah. Um, but you can play where everyone has a rule in effect, and if you do all the rules, you then shot the moon, shot the moon, and win the whole game straight up. One time I was one card from pulling that off, but it's it's tricky. That does sound pretty cool. By the way, does anybody mention Flux? No, but I don't know that that's the only way to win in Flux is by those rules. Yeah, yeah it, it is a game defined by its uh, alternate win conditions, I suppose. Well, what are we at then? We're at We're Space Race, Glory to Rome, Root Dominance, Arkham Horror, and... That's five. That's four. Oh. All right, we'll, we'll say heart slash in, in, uh, in, in uh, indulgence. That way, yes. it's the same thing. Shooting the moon. That does sound very cool. We did All it. All right. Maybe Question time, folks. <laughs> With ten minutes left on the clock. Well, we might go a couple minutes over to make up All for right, cause, cause of our... Uh, with router management. I don't think that's an epic fail. That's just a fail. That's not a... <laughs> epic while I was in here sweating up. Come on, reboot! Oh, I've done that so many times. I was sitting here going, I know what he's going through. Yep, yep, yep. Anyway, folks, if you have any questions that do not involve best games of the year, <laughs> uh, I'm actually curious. We'll have to, later on, after we post our top tens, so we'll have to compare them. I'm very yep. curious... How different yours and mine will be. Although, technically, I guess I could figure yours out since you put all your ratings on Board Game Geek. I, 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 yeah, I wear my heart on my sleeve there. Just go to rank.rao.com. You can see my top ten right now as of today. The biggest problem I have is there's a bunch of games that are real contenders for me that have not shown up in the mail yet. Yeah, but and some of those games, like I just realized that Ryan Lockett's game is going to be a 21 game. 
Oh, of course. Yeah, there's no way that's coming out. It's way too late. Uh, there's also a few games. Uh, the Praga game. The new Halatau from uh, Uwe yep. Rosenberg. And I haven't gotten Bonfire yet. I think you have, though, right? I have gotten Bonfire. I have not. I mean, I've heard really good things about Red Cathedral. And I'm really kind of bummed that I, I do not see that on the horizon for me. From DeVere. That yeah. one... Well, again, who knows? Um, Have you? I think you've gotten it. I think I saw you. Uh, yes, I did. One of your worst unboxings, which I always watch, just so I can say, "Why did Tom get that? Why did they send me a copy?" Just so you I shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. It's not good for you. <laughs> no, I know it's not at all. It's terrible. It's a very unhealthy obsession I have with that show. All right. Do friends and family ever yes. try getting us board games for Christmases slash birthdays? Um. I I would have to say no because my wife and I pretty much bailed on on holiday themed gift giving. Gosh, maybe not quite a decade ago, uh, there came a time when my when Jen said, "You know what? You are just really really hard to shop for." I'm like, "What? It's so easy." Um, but for her, it was very very difficult. And she said, "Do we really need to keep doing this every year?" And I was like, uh, "I'd be happy to stop because you're incredibly difficult to shop for." And um, so she told all the friends and family, look, from now on, we're just every year going to be doing um, donation, you know, charitable donations in your name kind of a thing. So you'll get one of those things in the mail saying, hey, you give into heifer.org or what have you. Um, so that's what we've been doing. And at some point, everybody stopped sending us stuff as well when they realized we weren't sending them stuff. So for me, no, I highly discourage it if possible. Uh, people don't normally ask anyway. Mm -hmm. On that regard. And I make it really clear that I'm not interested in board games at all. Yeah. So, I actually... Yeah, because why would you be interested in board games? Come on. Well, no, but I mean, I don't... It just would be very difficult. Um, I actually, a decade ago now, it's well over a decade, probably 13 years ago, I bought my kids board games, like kids games for Christmas. Okay. I wouldn't dare do that now. Because it wouldn't be special at all. So many kids games come through the house. And yeah. it'd be like, here's some more, you know. <laughs> but you understand, I actually bought these ones. Yeah, I know. Yeah, whatever, Dad. Well, you, you must be the easiest person in the world to Christmas shop for. Just do a Google search for funny tie and just done. You know, you would think so, but my kids never actually seem to think of that. Although I did get a tie, I think, last year. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, are you more tired, says William, of seeing roll and write games or polyomino games? I'm not tired of either. I don't understand fatigue of something that you really love. Uh, I, I I just played. Fine, I'll be the Grinch. Roll and right, and I enjoy them. And hey, we played some polyominoes. I want more polyomino roll and rights while we're at it. I am. I no. Have no fatigue. I actually think I prefer polyomino games to be polyominoes. Drawing the polyominoes into space is not as fun for me. Uh, polyomino games. I'll tell you what, though, that New York Zoo kind of reinvigorated me a bit. Really, I really liked it. Well, yeah, it's, it's a great example of it's it's a pure polyomino game, but then layering something else on top, the whole animal husbandry thing. So, but I didn't hear it. So, I know you have fatigue for both. Which one, it, w- what will make you groan less if somebody shows up and say, hey, Tom, do you want to play this oh, new polyomino, polyomino for game sure. or this new, it'd be, you'd rather polyomino? Polyomino, if only because, and I know this is cynical of me, I feel like it's a lot easier for a publisher to put very little effort into a roll and write. That is true. There's there are very few game designs that are easier to put together with a decent level of competence than a roll and write. And it's t- difficult to do something really special in that space. I'll agree. Um, what are your Christmas Eve dinners? Ooh, Christmas <sighs> Eve. I know what my Christmas Day dinner is. I haven't even thought about Christmas Eve. Normally, I allow my children on Christmas Eve to go wild when it comes to sweets. Mm. So, like, I'm like, Christmas cookies, eat them all. Here's some candy, eat it. <laughs> okay, guys, calm down. Yeah, That's yeah, normally how the night goes. Night. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, you know what? You don't need to eat all the candy. <gasps> yeah. I, I, we, we have no special holiday tradition along those lines at all, I'm sorry to say. Richard says, I'm still waiting for Etherfields. I hope that would be a 2020 game. Good news, I just got my shipping notice for Etherfields, so I feel like it, that has to be a 2020 game. Yeah. Um, because I'm talking about my regular backed version of it. Um, so, 
There may yet be a Christmas miracle coming. Hold on. Dream the dream. Let's see here. Pajamas with feet or no? No feet. Ugh. It's too too restrictive for me. Yeah, yeah. Slippers are the way to go, definitely. I want to have that flexibility. Uh, let me see here. Oh, unique snacks would be a good gift for me, yes. Um, oh, the, someone says, Liar Rado, you got fatigued on video games. <sighs> That's true. That is, I, I do stand accused, and I plead guilty. I... But, you know, that was an epic fatigue born of uh, two decades making them. Um, I guess maybe if, if I had to spend two decades making polyomino games, I might get kind of burned out on them, too. Hardest game to learn. Oh, hardest game to learn. Just in general? The I'm, I'm trying games? to think. CO2 was pretty hard. I don't really have a hard time with CO2. I mean, I, I know a lot of people had a hard, uh, problems with the rule book, but I mean, you just had to look at it thematically. And the problem was the rule book didn't put anything in terms of theme. So that one wasn't too terribly tough. Bridge? Um, hardest game to learn. I mean, I, I, I hate to bring it up. I know it's always a sore subject, but for me, I mean, there, there's no comp competition. Myth almost destroyed me. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's legit. Legit, I will accept myth. That's good. That's a good answer. <laughs> All right. Did the new edition of Cleopatra and the Society of Architects go over the top? Oh, with its production? Yeah. I mean, the original one was over the top. I'm going to go out here and say yes. I thought the oh. original one was over the top, but I'll tell you what. The original one I could at least throw in the box. The new one oh. you have to put in carefully without breaking it. And it's almost a detriment to playing it. I like it, but I suspect when I put it in the Dice Tower Library, I bet you very few people are going to pull it off the shelf because of the intimidation factor. Oh, wow. That's too bad. I mean, I, I, I have a feel for the publisher. I mean, because they feel like, oh, we've got to take it to the next level because it was already so far next level a decade ago. But, yeah, I guess there's too much of a good thing. Let me see here. Why don't games include animated flipbooks to help explain rules? Animated flipbooks? What does that mean? Well, that would mean literally... I mean, I would be a little handmade cartoon. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, that's not... <laughs> I don't think that's... <laughs> here comes the piece, you know. Uh, uh, what I don't understand is why more publishers are not flocking to... Um, what's it? That Dized format? I thought that was phenomenal. And I, it's really kind of... It, it's it's disheartening to see that it has not gotten... I mean, I, it bugs me that ISS Vanguard didn't come with a dies module that would teach me how to play that game. Because that would work so much better than anything else I've seen. I learned how to play Blood Rage with dies. Yes, but dies uh, is extremely like difficult God. to program. Really difficult. Well, yes, but... Um, I think Blood Rage is the most complicated I, I would thing they put in there. I rather the developers do all that work than me having to do that work. Quite frankly. Oh, I don't argue on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's the best rule book you've read? Oh. Okay, so there's a... I want to say Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. I really, really like how they teach you the game oh, yeah, through they scenarios. Oh, yeah. That's a master class in tutorial of a, of a really complex game. That's a good, that's a good suggestion. Um, I'm trying to, uh, let's see. There is one I covered just a couple months ago that, you know, did, did a standard good job on, you know, teaching the rules of this relatively complex game, but did an amazing job of integrating theme and setting and, you know, the, the history of the game that really elevated it so much. I'm trying to remember what it is. I, I just, I mean, I made a big deal at the time that I want to see more games doing this. Uh, oh, Shogun no Katana hasn't come out yet. It's I think it's Kickstarter ended last month. It was month. Kickstarter, yeah, yeah. But it's a it's a very it's a pretty straightforward worker placement game. But throughout, there's constantly they're not just throwing it in for for uh, you know fluff and flavor, but they throw in the real historical elements that they are trying to emulate, uh, and they put it in such a way that it makes it easier to learn the game because it makes it easier for you to put yourself 
in that place, in that historical thing, when you understand the real history, and then the kind of relatively abstract puzzle of sliding tiles around just comes together more. And I was blown away by that, and I will shout uh, mega kudos to them and every other developer who tries to do historical-themed Euros should definitely learn from that. All right, James says, is there a bo book or TV series you would like to see a board game of that doesn't have one already? So while you're thinking, here's what I would say, and uh, this is, uh, I, I really mean to be apolitical here, but I would uh -huh. say the West Wing, and I'll tell you why. I think it would be fun to run a little government that had issues thrown at it, and I would try to pick non-controversial issues, you know, different things, and you have to deal with these while appeasing Congress and or whatever, you know, like walking this fine balance line. Special interests. I would like stuff. it to be not, like I said, I don't want it to be super controversial, but I also wouldn't want it to be like, oh, they decided to paint the penny green. You know, I don't want it to be that yeah. nonsensical either. But like, That's a really good idea. Like, there's a lot Iraq is attacking Iran. What yeah. do you do? You know, do we get involved? Do we not get involved? What's the thing? If I, if I pick this decision then my approval here will go up, but it, it will go down over here. I think that would be just a fascinating thing, but it would be very difficult to do because it would be a, it sounds like a hard game to make, but it would also be a game that would probably offend somebody somewhere somehow, even if you yeah. tried to make it as apolitical as possible. Yeah. I do think that's a great idea, though, because there are tons of political games, but they're always about the race. And right. There's very few about the actual running the country. Exactly. My gosh. I really like that a lot. I'm going to steal that answer, particularly because my wife loves, I mean, uh, The West Wing is maybe the only series I've ever actually watched from beginning to end three times. <laughs> sure. I've maybe <laughs> done it myself. Uh, so uh, let's see here. <laughs> uh, Tom Brado has Mansion's first edition and it's two players, seven wonders, Hill to Dine Alone. What's your hill to die on alone? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like Duel of Ages. I feel like sometimes I'm the only person who likes that game. <laughs> there must uh, be something. Like, what's something I like that other people don't tend to like? Or, or, or an opinion or just a stand that you take. Like uh, me that I say Mansion of Madness First Edition is, to, is a superior experience to Second Edition, I think. And I'm very much in the minority on that. This is going to take some thought. I'm sure there's something, but I can't think of it off the top of my yeah. head. That is, a good top, that is a good top list candidate, actually, now I think about it. Because I have some other far-out opinions as well. Oh, Tom, see the Democracy 4 video game. Yeah, I know that game exists, and I played games. I played something in a Democracy series before a video game. I'm talking about a board game, though. Mm. Um, let's see... Uh, people are just talking about West Wing now. Um, <laughs> you got a bunch of pre-cooked chicken, a full pantry. What dish do you make? Chicken That's, and taco salad. Sounds good. Have My you seen Queen's Gambit TV. yet? Yeah. Which one? Have you seen Queen's Gambit, the no, Netflix series not. on chess? I will see before the year is out. I, I just, it's there's, the list is too long. Have you? Yeah, I have. Um, okay. I, there was a lot of parts of it I liked. I I disliked certain parts of it, but the the actual chess parts of it I liked a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what other game would we like to see turn into a TV series? Not Uno. Um, they're doing a new part, uh, TV uh, game show based on Uno. I would like to see maybe a TV show based on. Diplomacy, I think that'd be fascinating to watch. I would feel less stressed about it when it's not me. <laughs> um, I don't know. I've just I've played uh, Agricola so much, and I do. I I always. It's so rare that you see historical reenactment shows that are about the common people of that time. They're always about the royalty and you know Jane Austen type stuff. I've always find it more interesting. Well, no, the, the 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 people living their everyday lives. I, I I would think that'd be really interesting. Uh, you know, a uh, Germanic family in the uh, dark ages trying to get by i, I think there'd be really interesting stuff there 
All right, folks. Well, that, that, <laughs> this time, now we'll finish up here. We'll be back yes. in two weeks. We'll be on line um, on Rado's channel. So we'll see you then. I think, uh, stay tuned. We may not be back in two weeks. Whoa. Um, well, the Winter Spectacular Where's is happening on my channel at that point in time. So I'm not even sure if I can cross over. We might be back in. We'll, we'll, we'll announce it wherever oh, we're on. Now I feel bad not picking a holiday theme top five. Uh, maybe we'll do it the week bef the week of Christmas. If you're you're not doing anything anyway, you said. So like the 20th. No, Christmas is just another day to me. So, uh, yeah, probably in three weeks on Rado's channel then. Okay. <laughs> All righty, folks. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Rado. Have fun gaming. <laughs>